This is the Voluntary Virtues Radio Network. Welcome to Scholarly Sedition. I'm your host, Andrew Creshon. On this episode, we will be discussing agorism. What is agorism? <clears throat> Some people pronounce it agorism, but most people pronounce it agorism. Uh, Sam Konkin pronounced it agorism. Who is Sam Konkin? Well, he, he started a- agorism pretty much. He um he kind of coined the term in a modern day sense. Um, so I'll go by his pronunciation. Maybe I'll I'll start slipping and calling it agorism. I used to call it agorism actually till till pork fest a couple weeks ago. Till I, when I was corrected when I met um, one of the founding fathers of agorism, Jack Schmack. Uh, founder of Alt Expo, which is actually a separate event, a co- the competition to Pork Fest, if you will, also held at Rogers Campground during that same week. And he uh, he kind of started it actually as the agorist slash anarchist alternative to Pork Fest, since Pork Fest, back uh, when he started Alt Expo in around I think 2009. Um, had all statist programming, all, you know, how do we seize the Ring of Sauron and put it to our own uses, and Jack wanted anarchist stuff on the line, up on the schedule, and the first year he did it, he was he was told that, uh, you know, his panel wasn't really up to par, it wasn't really what Porkfest was looking for, and so he got all pissy about that and started, uh, started Alt Expo, and it's been a great... Um, a great source of topics that are not otherwise brought up on the official pork fest programming especially agorist topics and every year at alt expo there is um some good solid agorist philosophy and jack schmeck gave his introduction to agorism and advanced agorist theory this this year in 2014 so <clears throat> agorism is this philosophy started by Sam Konkin, and it is pretty much um, the means and the ends are the same in it, and that is using the market to end the state. And the state and the market here being defined as two two antagonistic slash exclusive entities, the private market versus the state. And um, Konkin would probably say that a lot of, you know, people conflate things to be private when really they're just the state operated, such as, you know, are the big banks really private? Is JP Morgan really private CEO who has all the power? Jamie Dimon up until a couple months ago was also head of the New York Federal Reserve. At the same time he was CEO, you know, the Federal Reserve was just a banker's trade union and he uh, he was the head of it, elected by the bankers, the members of the Federal Reserve. And he got to print all the money during all the quantitative easing, you know, 16 trillion of it that got handed out in secret. It was, it was leaked is how we even found out about this. So is he a government official? Is he a private sector? What is the government? Uh, um, you know, uh, one of Marx's uh, good quotes, you know, he had a lot of horrible things to say, but uh, he had a couple good quotes thrown in there, was um, the state is the executive committee of the ruling class. And I think this is pretty much true, you know. The state is everywhere a rent-seeking, you know, enterprise, whether for monetary rent some states attempt to maximize monetary rent and most fail at that uh, or whether through <clears throat> a psychic rent such as uh, you know Hitler trying to rid Germany of the Jews because he, he viewed them as some spiritual menace although he also was so insane he probably thought that they were taking away from monetary rent so you know pr- private monetary rent being seeked through the state really is just the state. The state, as Bastiat said, is that great fiction by which everyone attempts to live at the expense of everyone else. You know, the uh, the tariffs are passed at the behest of the domestic large industry. Uh, this, of course, hurts the poor, hurts the consumer, benefits a few Wall Street CEOs. You know, the money is printed, hurts the poor, hurts 
the retired savers. Benefits the large Wall Street CEO. War spending benefits large Wall Street CEOs. Government programs that produce poverty, you know, always look at these things with a, you know, who's got motive to do this? If government programs cause poverty, and, you know, is, is it really only the libertarians who see this? Maybe, you know, the rich are causing poverty on purpose. You know, kind of like, as we know as historical fact, the feudal lords used to <clears throat> used to cause poverty on purpose in, in Europe by imposing maximum uh, wage laws and, you know, entail pretty much prevented the large land cartels, you know, things the size of, you know, Disney World from being broken up as the market typically does. You know, all the large land holdings in New England, you know, New England used to be owned by, you know, 12 people, and this was all broken up now into the family farms we have today. The market naturally breaks up large land holdings in Austrian economics. The calculation theorem, you know, you can see uh, rich families, typically their grandchildren have, 90% of their grandchildren have lost their wealth. So the market breaks things up, unless you have entail or a war by, you know, the rich against the poor, like there was in feudalism, a sustained attempt that was successful to to keep the poor down and keep these land holdings from breaking up. Entail being the, the first one, you couldn't ever, you know, break the land holding up. It had to stay within the family. And pretty much the state, the kings, was kind of a, a cartel to make sure no one, you know, undercut the cartel and broke their quotas because that's how cartels work economically. And, you know, mortgaged their land or sold their land. It had to stay within the family to keep this cartel king system operating. And the Catholic Church, you know, provided a lot of this power and was kind of a centralized organizer of the cartel system. In Europe, the land cartel system. So that that's kind of how the ruling class used to keep people down. And now, you know, the ruling class keeps people down through... Through... Uh, other forms of regulation besides entail and the maximum wage laws on the, the Freemasons and all, you know, what the feudal lords used to do. Now we've got a lot of a lot of other sorts of regulation, you know, minimum investment laws. If you do have under a million dollars in capital, you're not allowed to invest in private IPOs. Um, a lot of other regulations that hurt the poor. Uh, the welfare trap obviously hurts the poor as well. So Kalkin kind of was very much a leftist. He promoted the left as kind of, the left always and everywhere means opposition to the existing system. You know, even when we got to the point of communist countries fighting rebellions against them that eventually took them down in the 90s, the, the hardline communists were referred, referred to as right, rightists, right? They were the conservatives. They wanted to keep the system. So right and left, Kalkin viewed as always being used ever since they originated in the French assembly where both, you know, Proudhon and Bastiat sat on the left. As leftist concepts, libertarianism being a leftist philosophy. But again, you know, the left, right, these are just words. You can define them however you want. So, Conkin's philosophy, you know, using the market to overthrow the state, overthrow this existing economic order... Of the rich, you know, using the state to consolidate their wealth is uh, is agorism, and pretty much this involves everyone going into the black market. You know, every activity going into the black market that's possible. And um, you know, when Conkin was writing before the internet, I think this would have meant first of all the breakup of the international division of labor, which has enabled a population that uh, is um, is about 10 times larger, I think, than we'd have without the international division of labor. There's, there's just so much wealth is produced by trade. You know, uh, communist countries and countries that don't trade are just so much poorer than countries that trade. And when you eliminate trade through either, you know, communism or, or socialism, to be more precise, or, or through tariffs, they really do the same thing. They just eliminate trade. There's um, 
you know, the, there's just so much poverty that's produced, and it's hard for people in the first world to really conceive of this poverty, conceive of the difference between starving to death and not starving to death, but that is, that is the norm in a lot of the world, that they're barely just not starving to death because of the international division of labor, and cutting that off, you know, boycotting them by doing, I think, full black market activity without a global division of labor, such as I think was the real functional result of what Conkin was preaching through this, you know, it would have been a tariff of the mind. We would have only, you know, grown our own food and used solar panels and not ever trade with anyone outside our neighborhood so the state could never see what we were doing and used gold. And maybe this would have defeated the state, it's true, but it, first of all, I think we would have been so much poorer. You know, read, read I Pencil. I Pencil, just no one knows how to build a pencil. If you try to figure out how to, you can't. It's so enormously complicated. Now, the caveat is how to build a cheap pencil. You want to try to build your own pencil, cut, get some lead and, you know, a knife and all that stuff. Well, you can do that. First of all, it's going to be very expensive. And second of all, you didn't make that knife even, you know. You really want to do every single thing internally. It's going to be enormously expensive. You know, different, a hundred different, you know, companies combined to make the smallest part thousands of skilled knowledge, you know, the price structure operates, things are shipped all over just to make the tiniest part cheaper. This is the economic calculation problem. To think that you can do this in some neighborhood underground economy, I think is a little far reaching. And, you know, uh, I think that's my kind of criticism of, of Konkin is the black market as a means to overthrow the state. I'm not, not exactly sure how feasible it is just because I think people would be so much poor if they were just engaged in local commerce as opposed to the international division of labor. Now, here's what kind of saves Konkin is technology. And, you know, Konkin wasn't writing in the Stone Age, so I don't know if the criticism I just gave is a real criticism because maybe Konkin saw this coming. And the technology thing is the Silk Road pretty much. Um, right now, you the international division of labor has been established with regards to certain illicit things. Um, murder for hire, you know, murder, whatever you want to kill it, killing for hire, assassination markets, drugs, um, guns, uh, all these things, the Silk Road, which is a Bitcoin-based online market, provides. So, um, This is international in scope, right? Um, economies of scale, are they being used? Can they be used? Sure, why not? I think, um, of course, it's kind of piggybacking over, over UPS and FedEx and the post office, but um, those, I think, too, could go with time. We could have, you know, just everyone driving around with things in their trunk and Silk Ride, <laughs> my buddy coined that. You know, maybe decentral things will pop up as soon as the government or you know UPS or FedEx increases their uh, their screening. But this is certainly uh, you know this crypto anarchy of you know Bitcoin. You know, gold can't be sent across the world instantaneously or in eight minutes or whatever. Bitcoin can. And the Silk Road, you know, works. We know it works, and it can work for anything, you know, that can be shipped. Uh, so things that can't be shipped perhaps are problematic. Um, seems to me like most things, except like maybe building materials, which couldn't really be agorist anyway because the state can spot buildings, but, you know, most capital that you could hide underground or in a warehouse or something, you could, you could ship there in pieces, you know, 100-pound packages, and just assemble, you know, in the backs of minivans, you know, they can't search just regular cars yet, the trunks of, you know, they can't, they can't search it if you're just driving around the U.S. Uh, across the border might be tougher. I figure probably all the small, a lot of small boats can cross the border, the Mexican border. Luckily, <laughs> thank God the Republicans aren't in charge. Luckily is porous. So the international black market division of labor is feasible now. Uh, you know, crypto anarchy. And furthermore, um, you know, the factors, the, the 
relations of production are changing. Um, the manufacture of a lot of things now can be done locally that used to have to be done, you know, globally for for rather cheap prices. 3D printing pretty much is, is the main change. And, and now that's very primitive, but in five years, you know, a metal 3D printer can print a gun now, you know, an AK-47 gun. And in five years, you know, they're going to be, instead of $10,000, maybe $1,000 um, <laughs> adjusted for inflation, whatever that means. Um, but they're going to be within, you know, the affordability of anyone. And so anything metal, pretty much that can be made of one metal and is enormously uh, sophisticated can be produced. So that'll be a huge improvement. And chemical 3D printers, you know, biological 3D printers, all these things will come down the line and technology will make them cheaper. Uh, you know, so that's one way that the market can destroy the state. Now, the state could respond to this, and obviously I think will respond, because what is the state, right? The state, this executive committee of the ruling classes, just all these rent seekers, you know, uh, Jamie Dimon, CEO of JP Morgan, you know, or whoever he <laughs> he's, uh, gives his money to, um, you know, the military industrial complex, and then even on the private level, just the, you know, the people getting welfare, the cops making 120 grand a year, you know, uh, the state is just a bunch of rent that's being handed out, loot that's being handed out. The people getting those loot, you know, know that, yeah, most of them know that violence is being used and uh, crackdowns are being used to secure it, and they're going to crack down and use violence um, to secure their rent. So probably yeah, the private prison industry, we have more slaves now working for corporations directly than we did during, because corporations own most of the slaves during the 1850s, and they own most of them today, almost all of them. The, not own it functionally, but rent their time out, you know, so it's a little different than slavery was in the 1850s, but they're just kind of nominal differences, semantic differences, and more more slaves now, because of all the victimless criminals that are in these private prisons and in the public prisons that are working for these corporations that are lobbying. Um, so what is, uh, you know, <coughs> what is the state going to do about it? Well, one thing is they could just set up checkpoints, right? They could search every car, like the border, as you're crossing maybe between states, and that would cut down the division of labor and make things much more expensive, and I think make agorism much more impractical. They uh, could, right, because, you know, all political activity comes from wealth, and if, you, if agorism, you know, if people practicing agorism are going to be poorer than the average individual, much poorer, you know, maybe they have to work 18 hours a day just to just get by, um, they're not going to have any time for, for reading, for political activism, for communication between other agorists, so pretty much free time, you know, the absence of work produces political freedom and that thought is necessary, education is necessary, learning is necessary, and capital, you know, wealth achieved through the division of labor, free flow of capital and labor, international trade and the international division of labor is absolutely necessary to freedom. And so, you know, agorism simply has to have this international division of labor. And if the state can destroy that, it'll be like entail in the Middle Ages, right? Only being able to give land to your kin by a system of rules, not auction or mortgage it off. What? why the land, the large land holdings were never broken up under feudalism like they were as soon as there was no entail, as soon as entail was abolished and feudalism was abolished, or as soon as, like in, you know, the U.S. where there was no entail to start with, you know, these large land holdings get broken up by the market. But if the regulation stops it from happening, if the regulation stops the market from overthrowing the state, and the regulation will stop the market from overthrowing the state. It will attempt to, at least. So maybe we're going to see more checkpoints. Uh, I know California used to search cars at these fruit and vegetable checkpoints to monitor for out-of-state pests. So maybe we'll see all states start doing that. And 
you know, the elimination of the division of the black market division of labor above the level of, you know, the state, not the state in terms of like general concept, but just, you know, going from Massachusetts to New Hampshire, maybe all the roads will be shut down, but the mains ones and there'll be vegetable checkpoints. Um, <laughs> and it sounds absurd, but they do this already with border checkpoints. You know, they'll have border checkpoints 100 miles north of the border. And they've already done veg veggie checkpoints in California. My friend Tabor used to live in California and go through these. They've softened a little bit in recent years. They don't search random cars anymore, but they did vegetable checkpoints um, to make sure you weren't bringing in out-of-state vegetables that might, <laughs> might have pests on them, right? Yeah, those dirty, you know, Arizona pest-ridden vegetables. But... Um, Quarantines for illnesses, maybe. And, you know, we have so many damn barriers in the international borders. Now, of course, people can get around those. So, yeah, I mean, the borders, they don't seem very well enforced right now. A lot of, uh, you know, Mexicans are certainly getting, er, more more accurately, I think Guatemalans, comprise most of them, are getting in recently. So, hopefully, the international borders remain lax, and internal borders in the U.S. aren't set up, so we can at least have a U.S.-wide division of labor. Um, and hopefully we can continue getting around the international borders so we can have the Silk Road operate on a global scale. Hopefully UPS, FedEx, and the post office don't start scanning packages. So Sam Conkin's, you know, philosophy of the market, you know, being the antithesis of the state and ending the state, and kind of the state being, you know, this false market, this superficial, you know, wealth, uh, except in communist countries when, you know, there was even no pretense of a, the state being legitimate market activity. But today, you know, this pretense, this shadow of oh, the central bank, you know, this private central bank and these, um, you know, this revolving door between Washington and, and big business and the state being different from you know large corporations and regulating large corporations when in fact you know the state and many large corporations you can't functionally view as different organizations you know when everyone at the FDA is in and out of Monsanto when everyone at the Fed is in and out of the big banks of the JP Morgan specifically the Treasury, J.P. Morgan, you know, there, there's no real functional difference between big business and government. It's just, it's the same thing as feudalism. It's, you know, the rich slash government versus the rest. But, but you know, what I'm, what I'm kind of describing here is Konkin's philosophy. And I'm going to give kind of a, a little bit of a nuanced critique on it in that really <clears throat> ever since entail was ended it's been kind of hard to tell what is private market activity and what is kind of the the false appearance of private market activity and these things are very fuzzy and i think Hawking is a little too a little too marxist a little too oh big business is evil um by definition and he kind of thought that um you know, the black market he didn't view as kind of having economies of scale. So I think his economics were a bit off. I guess he dedicated the book to Ludwig von Mises and Murray Rothbard, but I don't think he read much of them because his economics are way off. His economies of scale are way off. Um, you know, he kind of thinks mom and pop firms will, A, you know, end the state, which sure, maybe if everyone went reverted to mom and pop firms, they could end the state, but it would make it's all very poor so if you're willing to sacrifice wealth yeah sure um, and live in extreme poverty although just because kind of freedom comes from wealth I'm skeptical on, on that point but maybe it worked in his mind but anyway you know the fact that everything would continue to be a mom and pop business and no economies of scale would be used after the state is gone you know how, how would airlines where he has just mom and pop airlines you know would there be Everything just be a, um, you know, partnership um, or, I guess, large partnerships or co-ops. <clears throat> but, you know, economies of scale, obviously, are going to 
be used. Anyway, excuse me. <clears throat> I had a drink of water there. All right. <clears throat> so we are now going to discuss <clears throat> why I think economies of scale are kind of the natural outcome of the market and why I think these economies of scale are going to involve a lot of absentee ownership. So pretty much why, why I think Konkin's idea of kind of the mom and pop business unit overthrowing the state and being the norm for the rest of human history is absurd. Now, you know, I, I can still consider myself an agorist because I think the state is the antithesis of the market and the market, you know, to the extent that it expands, the state contracts, you know, just by definition. If ownership changes hands in society, you know, through consensual trade, more often than violent coercion, <clears throat> then ownership in that then that society, you know, is more of a market and less of a state. So the more the more interactions and ownership transactions that are violent, you know, the the heavier the role of the state in that society, and the fewer of them, the lighter the role of the state. And so yes, we want the market to determine where capital goes and not the state. We want the market to determine where money goes and labor goes. You know, we don't want these migration barriers. We want more immigration. We want more illegal immigration. And, uh, yeah, yes, ag agorists are very pro-illegal immigrant. Oh, if anyone is not is an agorist and is anti-illegal immigrant, you know, tell them to read some damn conkin. Um, so I consider myself an ag agorist, but, you know, kind of an open agorist. I guess not a closed agorist, to borrow that term from Ayn Rand devotees who have a kind of open objectivism which is where you can <laughs> where you can disagree with Rand and then closed objectivism which is kind of kind of creepy um, the idea that you don't ever disagree with her on anything and I don't know how many closed Konkinites there are if there's anyone who literally doesn't disagree with him on anything maybe these two fellows I met at breakfast but I, I can't even say that um, so anyway I think economies of scale are the natural order of things, and they kind of necessarily involve absentee ownership. I'll give one example. Um, an airline. So uh, suppose that an airline doesn't really require any employees who have a market wage that's necessarily high, right? Um, <clears throat> you know, there's only a few market wages that maybe are high enough to afford an airplane, uh, any you know, a market wage is how much a firm benefits financially by your labor, you know, minus whatever the overhead is. So if uh, your labor helps the firm, you know, uh, each year gain five million dollars, and they're paying you less than five million dollars, and the firm's making out, so your salary is going to be something less than five million dollars. Probably not too much though, because if you can do produce five million dollars worth of uh opportunity at, at any firm or close to that <clears throat> then other firms will be willing to pay you something in the neighborhood of five million dollars and bid your price up towards that so you know market market wage is just an economic thing you know mor morality aside <laughs> you moralize against it but that's like moralizing against why you know Apples are more expensive than oranges. Uh, it's just you know, moralizing against price is absurd. If prices weren't what they are, there would be shortages. Price fixing causes shortages. And if everyone, you know, price fixed of their own accord and out of morality, then shortages would occur as well. Since no one would be trading when they should be. You know, the, pr the market price is just what maximizes you know, trade when the supply equals the demand. Otherwise, the supply is more than the demand, or the demand is more than the supply. Where was I going with that? Yes. Um, so, 
Konkin's uh, idea that economies of scale are always, you know, kind of state imposed, I think is wrong. Obviously, you know, I think airlines, um, you know, pilots, their market wage isn't enough to buy airplanes. You know, pilots will tell you, yeah, you know, a good pilot, he will rake in 100, 200 grand a year flying commercial aircraft. That's what they're worth, you know. Uh, but the commercial aircraft is maybe uh, 40 million, 50 million, 100 million dollars. So you have to crowdfund these things, right? Crowdfunding is huge, a great concept. And you can crowdfund through public share offerings or through charity drives or how, however you want to. Um, you know, there's no state in the ideal world to tell you how to do these things. And the state today offers a few different options to crowdfund legally. It's like Indiegogo, um, the stock market, of course. You can have non-profit corporations run by a board of directors that the state approves of. You know, the stock market is kind of the most, you know, sensible way to do it for a variety of economic reasons that I can go into here. I think stock markets would exist without the state, unlike Konkin. And I think we can already see this in real life in that there's already like Bitcoin stock markets, right? Bitcoin stock markets that are completely illegal and don't really exist. And so, you know, the Bitcoin securities market, futures markets, all, all these things, these funding ways, you know, crowdfunding in a, uh, in a sense that you expect to get return, financial returns. Because I think Indiegogo, let's, you know, when you crowdfund, you get in-kind returns such as if you crowdfund a movie you get you know tickets to the premiere or something but they don't let you get financial returns which is just an absurd legal you know restriction the government imposes on them so that they don't have to comply with stock market regulations but you know really there'd be no difference in real life between indiegogo and the stock market it would just be indiegogo would be the stock market right is indiegogo an evil state created company I, I think these arguments by some of the leftists are absurd. So you're going to have a lot of crowdfunding. And what does crowdfunding mean? Well, you know, it means that the crowd funders are probably going to have a lot of the influence on the company. The workers, of course, will have some influence just because they'll negotiate for their job, you know, their wages, the contract between them, the agreement between them. Everyone will agree, right? There won't be any violence. There will be less violence than today, right? Or there's no point in doing this thing. And so... You know, the workers will agree with the crowd funders and the crowd funders will have some power and the workers will have some power. And uh, I don't, you know, I, th I think obviously if you're going to fund something, you're gonna, going to want to know that someone looking out for your interests is in charge. I think there's going to be a board. There just has to be. So I, I don't really see, you know, why this traditional profit firm structures evil like kind of Konkin says and why it'll disappear without the state the state does a lot of things to impose artificial economies of scale you know regulations are often fixed costs and whenever wherever there's fixed costs there's economies of scale which promote larger actors and remember the state has an incentive to do this as as Marx correctly pointed out you know, the state can't um, produce socialism in a nation of mom and pop storekeepers. It needs uh, large centralized economies of scale, uh, which kind of the market naturally tends to accumulate in order to even think about socializing and nationalizing industry. You know, Marx had a lot of correlations, right? Just not the causations. And so, um, Konkin's. Uh, You know, Konkin's idea that all private industries is evil, I think, you know, it's like more Marxist than Marx. He, would, he calls it, uh, he calls himself more Rothbard than Rothbard, but the, the idea that all private large firms are inherently, wouldn't exist without the state and are benefiting from the state and kind of, kind of by definition are the state and that the state is just, you know, a bunch of lobbyists and congressmen and rent seekers and it's a uh, you know obviously you can't uh, you can't just ignore economics so 
what one thing I often get in fights with agorists or kind of mutualists also or kind of similar to agorists <laughs> it's the hard, hardcore agorists that don't that think they'll just be mom and pop storekeepers I think are almost more insane than mutualists because mutualists at least recognize economies of scale they just want the workplace to be democratic instead of um, you know so the, instead of the crowd funders electing the board they want the workers to elect the board um, and there's also kind of schools of left anarchism that think the consumers should elect the board of any firm. You know, Konkin doesn't really think there will be a board. There'll just be small partnerships. And, you know, I, I think it's kind of the pretense of knowledge almost to predict these things. But insofar as the market has been allowed to operate, we can see that I think the crowd funders will be more you know, uh, inclined to set up organizations and then hire employees versus the employees coming together, negotiating, and just drawing a loan. That's how it's traditionally worked, but there has been a lot of state interference, of course. You know, we can look at the Bitcoin stock market, but this doesn't give us, you know, a ton of data. So I think it's kind of the pretense of knowledge to say, here's how, you know, all the firms will be co-ops, you know, democratically organized flat firms, or to say that all the firms will be for profit, you know, and Rothbard was kind of the other extreme here, he said kind of in the market without the state, all the firms will be for profit, uh, you know, firms that are, you know, controlled by investors. And remember, controlled by kind of Konkin says, oh, um, you know, people like Rothbard thought that the world should be or will be controlled by the owners of capital. It's like the owners of capital don't really control anything. You know, they're out of a job as soon as they stop following the consumer's orders. They have very little freedom in the ability to dispose of their capital or their capital will be gone and they'll no longer be rich, you know, except for a few rent-seeking industries. And even those rent-seeking industries have to viciously compete in order to maintain their rent, both on the market and in the state, you know, power structure. If Goldman Sachs stopped offering any banking services, it wouldn't be able to retain, you know, the largeness it needs to have the too big to fail status and the preferred vendor status of the open market transactions when they do QE. So, and and you know something like Walmart. Kevin Kevin Carson is kind of a mutualist. Is always trashing on Walmart and saying, well, uh, you know, they're completely evil. And I was having a discussion. And they're, they're a state invention, and there's no market you know, utility to them. And if they disappeared, we'd be much better. And I was having this uh, discussion with Nick Ford at the kind of around the campfire at Porkfest, who's he's the abolish work guy, which I, I agree with the concept. Yes, let's abolish work. But you know, instead of just bitching about work, how do we abolish work? And that's through lower prices compared to wages. So people are saying, oh, Walmart pays low wages. Yeah, um, but Walmart offers extremely low prices. And so you, maybe 1% of the workers in the town work at a Walmart. Hopefully, soon it'll be 0%. We'll just automate the whole thing. I love automation. I love destroying jobs. Destroying jobs is the only way anyone ever becomes richer, the poor included. And uh, so anyway, these low prices at Walmart, maybe it'll be automated soon. Maybe it'll just be one big vending machine or there'll be drone delivery or you know whatever beautiful future technology can conjure up for us. Uh, as, you know, Jeff Tucker's the master of a kind of glorifying these things but anyway when you take away cheap prices when people instead have to shop at mom and pop owned bodegas which is the case in many cities today uh you know people have they have to work a lot more instead of working 20 hours a week they have to work 60 hours a week just to be able to afford to live if they don't have walmart you know if they have to shop and i used to live in new york city um where there are only bodegas where whole foods was the only non-bodega option and you had to take a subway to get there you know milk two times as much as walmart uh you know candy you know, five times as much as walmart so really poor people were living you know their way real wages were just being slashed by half two-thirds whatever because the government had zoned out walmart pretty much walmart always buys land in these cities and the government just kind of finds some <laughs> zoning provision they can use to to boot them out, you know. Uh, and usually the government, the zoning board, is pretty much kind of just owned by the local, the small, quote-unquote, businesses and the kind of the activists sometimes. But 
But anyway, in you know, the mom and pop bodega are much more expensive. You know, Conkins black market mom and pop bodegas would be much more expensive, and the poor suffer hard. You know, they would, you know, be able to escape poverty if they had access to cheap groceries, but they don't. Um, you know, it's like if if every employer in the country cut, if every employer in Boston specifically cut every minimum wage employee's salary by, you know, two-thirds, there would be violence and riots. But when the Boston Zoning Commission doesn't let Walmart open, it does the same thing economically. And you have to, you know, study economics and look at this and see, you know, what, um, you know, what's really keeping poor people down. And a lot of that is restrictions to economies of scale and global trade and, you know, all these investment opportunities that rich people have. And usually it's kind of the Baptists and the bootleggers is, you know, a few rich rent seekers lobby to keep the poor down and uh, then pretend it's for the public good. You know, we don't want the poor to get suckered into, you know, private IPOs or private stock offerings. So uh, we're going to outlaw anyone with less than a million dollars from, from entering one. It's like, whoa. Yeah. Uh, they, they do that. It's a law. Look up the SEC's accredited investor definition. So anyway, um, you know, I think Hawking's right about a lot of things. Uh, I just think that, you know, you can't ignore the fact that economies of scale and the, and the division of labor and the global division of labor, you know, provide. But maybe, you know, the Silk Road's our way out, crypto anarchy, which kind of the guy who founded coined the term crypto anarchy Tim May he considered himself an anarcho-capitalist and he considered crypto anarchy and anarcho-capitalist philosophy uh, Cody Wilson kind of a more recent crypto anarchist is kind of more anti-capitalist uh, and it kind of is just a semantic thing if, whether you define capitalism as um, private ownership in the means of production or whether you define capitalism as a, a system of state privilege to capitalists you, know, you can define these words however you want. Um, Konkin defined capitalism as uh, you know the latter, kind of the Marxist definition. So he was anti-capitalist, but really it's just you know people using the same words but speaking different languages. At some point, it's like uh, who cares if we're defining words differently because the argument's not about words; it's about truth. Which so that, you know, let's pick a system of words. That might not be perfect, but which we can arrive at truth from. And I'll change my definitions a little if I have to, because the definitions aren't imp what's important here. It's, you know, the truth. And as long as you use consistent definitions, you know, you could define the state as um, the market, and the market is the state. And if you use consistent definitions, and just go through your, uh, you know, argument, you'll, it'll come out the same. <laughs> You know, it's a little silly. Why pick definitions that everyone isn't using already, right? That's the point of language to make it accessible. So I, I like using the most widely acknowledged definitions. And, you know, maybe for capitalism, that does mean, you know, the system of state privilege, just because it seems like more people use that. And if we're going to communicate with them, communicate the truths we know to them, uh, instead of getting them to change their definitions, let's be flexible. Maybe we can use that definition when arguing with them. But when arguing with maybe Republicans who don't define capitalism that way, who define capitalism more similar to private ownership of the means of production, then uh, we can use uh, use the definition of, of capitalism that Rothbard prefers as opposed to the one Konkin prefers. But anyway, I, I guess I'll talk a little more about Jack Schmeck, uh, kind of another f a founding father of agorism. Um, and uh, he was talking at Porkfest. He gave a few great lectures on agorism, introduction to agorism, and advanced agorist theory. And kind of one thing is he, he explained his you know journey to try to practice what Konkin wrote about in this philosophy, which was you kind of using the market to defeat the state. Konkin had four stages of agorism. This, you know, stage one is, oh, I'm the only agorist I know. You know, stage two is, well, I've uh, I found some other agorists, and um, 
you know, we'll, we'll start trading with each other in the black market and, you know, finding out what black market activity there is and, you know, preaching to them agorism and, you know, stage three is there will be this large agorist trading network that's explicitly anti-state and uh, will have its own justice mechanisms even. And stage three to stage four transition is when those justice mechanisms will in fact prosecute the state. And stage four is, you know, just the black market is everything there is in the state. And, you know, stage four, agorism is kind of anarchy, right? The agorism is an anarchist philosophy. So that was kind of it, what he described an introduction to agorism. And, you know, I'm not obviously doing justice. It was a one hour talk. Um, I'm not doing justice to the thing, <laughs> but um, it advanced Agoras theory, he kind of talked about his experience of, you know, doing things on a cash basis, not leaving a paper trail, things cock and promoted. He talked about doing... Um, an underground agorist cab business, which I guess is a popular, popular thing. We've got some uh, people doing that I know in New Hampshire and uh, Lyft and Uber are kind of agorist partially. They're kind of big, large Wall Street traded corporations, which Kong would have hated, but they're operating illegally in all these cities pretty much, or in the gray market at least. Probably the revenue will still be taxed, so not agorist in that sense. You know, I mean, a true agorist cab just would, you know, take Bitcoin, wouldn't even handle FRNs, right? You're, you're paying taxes when you use FRNs because the government doesn't even need to, need to tax. You can just print. But anyway, he started a true, well, not maybe not true because he took cash, <laughs> agorist business, a cab business out in the, the oil boom in North Dakota where, you know, there's billions of dollars in capital and labor pouring in and all these people are getting flown in to work a week, flown out, making $120,000 a year as, you know, 20-year-olds with no college degree. It's just a huge boom town, and he's a black market cabbie and making a lot of money. But, you know, so I, I propose to Jack is a, well, how are we going to have an agorist oil rig, right? How, how are we ever going to have a, have a agorist large industry? And large industry is essential, so... That's kind of a okay, good critique of agorism as a strategy in and of itself to destroy the state. But, um, well, he said, well, agorism is interstitial, right? In between the layers is interstitial. It's kind of a term from chemistry. Hawking was a chemist, I guess. And uh, so, you know, you want to build interstitially in the layers the state doesn't have to control just kind of, of because of these necessary economies of scale. And it's like, yeah, but is interstitially enough, Jack? Uh, <laughs> for instance, in Spain, 60% um, of the country works off the books just because the minimum wage and all these other labor regulations are so bad. But it's, it's not an agorism, right? The, the stage three, stage four transition certainly hasn't been reached. And maybe it's because they don't have the right philosophy or whatever. But it seems like you can have a pretty large black market. And, you know, why should the philosophy matter? The state is still damn strong. Um, if the black market, you know, can't physically stop the state, you know, regardless of philosophy, at 60% of the economy, if the Spanish state is in many respects stronger than the U.S. state or other states that have almost all above-board economies, and then this also seems to be a critique of agorism as a functional philosophy. Well, I mean, what uh, what alternatives are there? Are there to agorism is another question. There's kind of the political alternative, as Rothbard describes, just pretty much striving towards nullification and secession at the lowest levels of of government possible so you know what should the UN do on abortion or what should the UN do on X it should be you know nothing uh, secede from the UN what should the, the fed US federal government do on X nothing secede what should the state government do you know nothing secede nullify uh, what should the county same thing what should the town you know same thing what should the parish neighborhood same thing what should the property owner same thing you know Rothbard uh 
was a political person who thought the Libertarian Party would kind of save us and the, the Koch brothers would, <laughs> would fund it and everything would be fine. Um, it was probably a little uh, optimistic. I, I think Conkins actually turned out to be more accurate than Rothbard. You know, they had this feud, Conkin and Rothbard. You know, they wrote essays at each other. Uh, I recommend reading them. They're fascinating. And um, I think Rothbard's strategy kind of hasn't worked as much, right? The political libertarianism, you know, what what do we have? The Tea Party to thank for that? Uh, <laughs> or what do we have to thank for political libertarianism? The Tea Party, you know, is this an improvement? Um, you know, ban porn. <laughs> Santorum, he's a Tea Party guy. No, he's like the Tea Party guy, apparently. Uh, I'm skeptical on politics. Agorism, I suppose I'm a little skeptical as well. Uh, there's kind of like Larkin Rose's, you know, just shoot the bastards. You know, Chris Cantwell, um, you know, hey, all it takes is, uh, you know, the same number of cops, of people, to just say, hey, we're not going to take shit, and the state disappears. You know, also skeptical about that because the state, you know, can drone people nowadays. And who's to say it can't just, you know, raise up a militia that's larger than yours of statists? Because there certainly are a lot of statists out there. A lot of them have guns. A lot of vets who will fight for the flag have guns. So I'm not sure if that's practical either. You know, why not some combination of all these? Uh, Rothbard wrote an essay, Are You a Push the Button Anarchist? Meaning, would you do away with the state? You know, tomorrow if you could, and I say, you know, yeah, sure, I'm, and I'll push any, you know, button that that isn't too horrible, right? I don't want to violate the non-aggression principle, but uh, any button I can get my hands on, I'll push. <laughs> and um, the kind of not push the non-push the button anarchist, the uh, maybe the sequentialists say that we have to do certain things like kind of marxist was very focused on sequencing is you know first we need a totalitarian state you know then we'll end end of the state <laughs> you know right marx was an anarchist he's a sequentialist uh, some people say well we don't want to cut welfare or anything because there's all these absentee property holdings but um you know eventually after we have a little bit more socialism then we'll kind of seize the factories and end of the state <laughs> You know, but Rothbard was, you know, just kind of a push the button. Hey, you know, if every cop choked on his donut tomorrow, we'd have anarchy, and that'd be a great thing. Uh, so he, Rothbard was kind of more comfortable with traditional firm structures, and you know, with the idea that it still exists after the state, and maybe with the idea even that the same ones would still exist after the state, in some cases. Um, you know, so what does this mean? Does this mean there'd be a real kind of physical confrontation between people, uh, the mutualist left trying to seize Walmarts and kind of, you know say the owners are illegitimate, the workers should own it. If they're if the Walmarts are automated, I'm not sure what that would mean. <laughs> the mutualist philosophy kind of breaks down at that point. Uh, probably just like the surrounding mob, you know, wh whoever's hanging around, you know, the community around it. Would, would grab it. Agorism, I guess, just don't ever do business with Walmart. Not, but, you know, if there's no state, agorism kind of isn't a tactic anymore. It's just how the world looks. So I guess the agorists would have to throw up their hands and say they're wrong if Walmart exists without the state. Um, Rothbard wouldn't have a problem with it. Jeff Tucker certainly wouldn't have a problem with it. So I think it's kind of like the more radical anarchists are the ones who are willing to accept, you know, the idea of firms, large firms, because they're kind of the more push the button people who kind of say, yeah, just do away with the police and everything, you know, is going to be fine. We're not going to have, you know, slavery or whatever. People are warning against that if we do away with the police, oh, the corporations will take over, the children will starve, we need the government, we need taxes. It's like, no, no, we don't. Um, the world will work out fine, and maybe a lot of things won't even be that different. You know, let's just do it. I, so I, I think the more radical ones are almost kind of what Jack was kind of referring to as right anarchy. <laughs> so right libertarians, what kind of Conkin did as well. These people who he said, oh, the world will, in their mind, as soon as the state disappears, will still be controlled by the owners of capital. But it's like, well, the owners of capital are controlled by the consumers. Uh, no one's really controlled by anyone in the market. Um, 
So, <clears throat> you know, when a laborer rents his services to an employer, does he control that employer? When a capitalist rents his services, you know, to someone, does he control that person? It's all just arbitrary. Um, you know, if there's no other options, if you've got no liquidity in your human capital, if you can't move because you're a slave, then, uh, you know, you're being controlled. But otherwise, kind of it's hard to say who controls who. It's really just the you know, people controlling themselves and making a buck and arranging themselves in firms and some people getting paid more than others and you know, some people getting paid dividends and other firms maybe being democratic. Uh, we'll see. But that's my you know, criticism of agorism. Probably slipped and called it agorism a few times. And if you have any any further questions about the philosophy, uh, you know, direct them either to me or to Jack Schmeck, uh, Jack S C H M I C K. He's kind of the expert on agorism. Um, that gave that talk at Alt Expo and started Alt Expo as the agorist, you know, anarchist alternative to the statist Porkfest in 2009. Of course, now Porkfest is, has gone anarchist and they have a bunch of anarchist programming, but you know, they kind of set the tone over at Alt Expo. They had alt currencies going even before Bitcoin. Um, it was a fun, you know, it's, it's a great kind of, I think Konkin bridges the gap between left and right anarchism in a really productive way. And uh, he is, um, you know, to whatever extent those things exist. Him and, and Cody Wilson, too. Maybe I'll do a whole episode on Cody sometime, because he's a fascinating guy. Cody's also kind of along the same lines philosophically, but, you know, that's my take on agorism, and uh, I'm an open agorist, and think the philosophy is, uh, is cool, and, you know, maybe I'll just start calling myself an agorist uh, without adjectives. <laughs> I just don't bl blindly accept everything Conkin says. So uh, that is the end of Scholarly Sedition. I'm your host, Andrew Crishone, signing off, and this is the Voluntary Virtues Radio Network.